give it up for Ann, everybody. Thank you. Hello, I'm gonna try not to hide behind the podium for this one. I'm Ann Cahalan. I am an application developer for a company called Detroit Labs. You'll never guess where that is located. Uh, I should say that I'll be sharing some insights throughout this presentation on how to tell if you have tripped and fallen into a Jane Austen novel. Those all come from a fabulous website called The Toast. Uh, like a lot of you, I have been working in Swift for just about as long as Swift has been a thing. And in fact, Swift is kind of my first love as a programming language. It's the first language I felt really competent in and the first one I could kind of think in, if that makes sense to you. And I'm the sort of person who learns things by analogies, by sort of comparing things that are new to me to things that I already know. And my background is in literature and history, so of course I immediately saw connections between some of the most fun parts of Swift and some of the heroes of one of my favorite authors, Jane Austen. Uh, if you've interacted with popular culture at all, ever, uh, you're familiar with the works of Jane Austen, even if you don't know it. Her plots have been recycled into um, every romantic comedy ever, basically. Uh, in a quick nutshell, Jane Austen wrote six novels between 1787 and 1811. She mainly wrote about the lives of women, how they navigated their social constraints and the expectations of their time. Um, she gets dismissed as sort of writing silly, you know, romantic novels. And although most of them end with the heroine marrying her beloved, they also involve a lot more cutting social insight and commentary than they're given credit for. We're not here to talk about uh, feminist literary criticism in Jane Austen, but we can do that later if you want over a drink. Um, we're here to talk about Swift in Jane Austen. Um, so let's start with Jane's, uh, Austen's probably most famous work and Swift's probably most famous uh, design pattern. Um, in fact, Swift has been described as a protocol-oriented programming language. Let's talk about delegates and protocols and how they are like Mr. Darcy. I promised you there wouldn't be any homework for this, so I will recap the plot of everything I'm gonna talk about very quickly. Um, one day, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy shows up at Netherfield Hall. Uh, he is immediately sort of appalled by all of the, the locals, and they are equally appalled with him because he makes a terrible impression. A uh, army officer named Mr. Wickham shows up. He makes a better impression on everyone. Darcy starts to warm up to Elizabeth Bennet. Elizabeth Bennet starts to warm up to the, Mr. Wickham. Um, Darcy rushes to her side, Lizzie's side, to uh, say that even though her family is horrible and she's kind of tacky and he's tried really, really hard not to, he is terribly in love with her and so I guess they have to get married. Um, pro tip, I don't know if you've been in a position to propose to someone, but leading with how they're awful is probably not a great way to do it. Um, meanwhile, Mr. Wickham has run off with Lizzie's younger sister, Lydia. This is terrible because this is Regency England and you don't do things like that. Um, everyone panics. They can't bring Lizzie back. They can't, or Lydia back. Um, but it turns out that somehow everything turns out well in the end. Mr. Darcy has bought off Wickham to marry Lydia, absolving her of scandal, and in return for a small uh, bribe, basically. Um, Darcy returns, they take a walk in the garden, he proposes, it's all swooningly romantic. This glosses over a whole lot, including some of my favorite characters, but the important part here is the thing you've seen over and over again, that two people meet, hate each other, and then slowly fall in love. Of course, this is like delegates and protocols, right? <laughs> um, this is the Swift documentation. Uh, it's the translation, basically, is that uh, a protocol is a contract that your class or whatever conforms to. It's a blueprint for its behavior. Um, each delegate has a set of default behaviors, uh, variable declarations, all kinds of things that they are both required and optional that they must conform to. And it is up to each delegate kind of to uh, implement that functionality. It's like a contract. The protocol lays out the expectations and whatever conforms to it fulfills those expectations. So let's say we have some scoundrels and some gentlemen and they're going courting. Both of them conform to a wooing delegate because both of them will be wooing, which means they promise to have a method called wooing attempt. But as you can see, each one is going to woo very differently. Why does this matter? Well, let's say you're keeping track of your, all of your suitors in a table view, that's very organized of you, and you want each table view show, cell to show each suitor's best attempt at wooing. By using a protocol and setting this delegate, your table view cells don't need to know or don't need to care if the suitor that they're displaying is a gentleman or a scoundrel. They just know both of them will have a wooing attempt and they can display it. That's one use of protocols and it's pretty handy. 
But protocols can be extended to include default implementations, so taking away that step where whatever is conforming to the protocol handles how it's uh, implemented. In this instance, all of your suitors sell, uh, send the same love letter, because love letters are hard to write, so they all cribbed off of Darcy's second, much better proposal. Um, you can set up default implementation of a love letter, and they all conform to this wooing delegate, and they all send the exact same love letter, and you don't have to rewrite anything a thousand times. It just happens. And in fact, a table view is a really great example of the power of delegates and protocols, because there's a lot of the really tedious work of setting up a table view happens in this protocol, the table view uh, delegate. By conforming to that, you just have to provide how many sections you have, how many rows you're gonna have, all of this other implementation. You just sort of give them a number, like here, we have this many count. And under the hood, there, uh, Apple does all of the work in the protocol of setting up the, the screen for you. You don't have to mess around with that. So why, didn't, uh, why did I think that protocols and delegates were like Mr. Darcy? It felt a little, when I was first encountering them, like some sort of titled nobility coding practice. This was some fancy pants business. Uh, it felt like the code that I was looking at knew something that I didn't know. And I don't react to that kind of thing well. Uh, why couldn't I do something like inheritance with this or couple together the table view, table view cell with the type of data it's gonna contain? Well, okay, why not create a separate table view cell for scoundrels and one for gentlemen? But where does that, where does that road end? Uh, what about a different table view cell for social climbers or cads or well-meaning dolts? Because as it turns out, coupling those things together can lead to a sort of Wickham level disgrace in your code. Bad, indiscreet code that's tightly and inappropriately coupled together, running off to bath without getting married, like L Wickham and Lydia, is only going to bring shame on you and your entire family. Don't do that. <laughs> Mr. Darcy, as it turns out, was really just kind of an awkward guy with resting bitch face, which, if you encounter it for the first time, can feel kind of like it, you're being judged or, or like hostility. When I first encountered protocols, they felt inscrutable. Like, why was there this wall, this separation between the code I was looking at and what it was actually doing? I felt like it was another extra layer of uh, complexity, another place where I had to go to see what my code was doing. But in the end, this kind of cleanly separated code that follows a defined contract that you can rely on is not only upstanding and respectable, it is going to quietly rescue you in the background from all manner of disaster. We don't need a thousand types of cell, table view cells. We don't need to couple each together, each instance of a suitor to a unique cell. We can share the code that's common. We can enforce some decorum and gentility between the data that we're handling and the code that needs that data. So that was protocols and delegates. Um, let's talk about another thing. This is not necessarily my favorite Swift feature, but it's definitely my favorite Jane Austen hero. Um, true story, I used to have a copy of Persuasion in my car, and if I was stuck in traffic, I'd just go to the best parts and read those. Um, I don't do that anymore because I have it on my phone. Also, I don't have a car. Um, Persuasion is one of those novels that opens like several years after a bunch of things have happened. In this case, seven years before the novel opens, uh, Anne Elliot broke an engagement with uh, Freddie Went Frederick Wentworth. He was an ambitious naval officer, but he didn't come from a prominent family. Anne's father had a title and a manor house and, and all of this wealth and prestige, and people convinced her that she would be marrying beneath her. Um, Frederick Wentworth went on to become Captain Wentworth, celebrated hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anne's father blew all of their money, uh, and so they were reduced to having to rent out this manor house that they were so proud of, and because this is a novel, they rented it to a friend of Wentworth's. Um, one day, they're all out for walk. Wentworth comes back into her life. There's some other characters. He is pursuing one of the other women in the novel. There's a, a fall happens, and it's one of those, like, it, Regency scenes of people panicking and women fainting and all of that. Anne keeps her head about her, um, arranges for a doctor to arrive, handles all of this stuff. Wentworth starts to reconsider. Uh, eventually, there is this amazing scene where they're in a drawing room and she's having a conversation with someone else about whether or not men or women fall out of love faster. And while he's listening, he's writing her this gorgeous love letter about how he still has found that he is in love with her, and if she, you know, is still interested, he'll meet her downstairs. Um, and so they all live happily ever after. So let's go back to our sorting of suitors. Let's say now we want to organize things a little better. 
We want to change our background color, add some label text based on the setting and the suitor in question. We pass in, we can pass in which setting and which suitor each cell is for and do a whole chain of like if else nonsense. Um, and our setup method will be 900 lines long. And even if we pull some of this out into smaller methods for like extracting bits of this, we're still going to be doing a whole lot of work here that maybe we don't need to do. So we can try this a different way. And instead of doing if else's, we can do a switch statement. And this is easier, I think, to scan. Um, and it feels a little more big girl pants developer than a chain of uh, ifs. But I'm not sure what this gains us in terms of cleanliness or readability. It's not a huge step forward. So let's think a little bit more uh, directly about what we know and what we need. So we know we have a limited number of settings and that we want to associate a background color with each of them. We know that certain suitors are only found in certain settings. Why don't we make a thing that holds all of our discrete settings, the colors that we want, and the suitors that we have? Maybe like an enum with some computed properties. And then like maybe some of those computed properties could be enums of their own with their own computed properties. And now we've got a set of suitors with their names and their descriptions and our settings with discrete suitors associated with them directly. And what if we can form some of these enums to the protocol and do like some sort of crossover of persuasion and, and sense, or pride and prejudice, and then we can get that contract in place so we have some reliable expectations for our suitors. If blocks can be expensive, they're spendthrift with your attention and your brain power. One of the first Swift projects that I worked on, uh, the one where I accidentally ended up ordering a whole ton of sandwiches, um, was a restaurant app with a lot of table views whose structure and appearance was similar but slightly different, heavily dependent on other things. Uh, was it a delivery or a pickup order? Which restaurant were you going to? Which of the five different menus were you looking at? And I was encoding in these increasingly dense if blocks that were starting to get very mentally expensive to keep track of. It was hard to hold all of the possible paths in my head that all of my data could go down. So like Wentworth, both the switch and enum constructions have been around for a while. But in Objective-C, uh, switch statements were kind of limited. You could only switch on integral types. Um, Swift has given it broader horizons now. We can switch on strings or on types or on ranges, tuples, just about anything. And I feel like Swift sort of lends itself to this kind of construction way more than to using enums and structs and things like that, way more than Objective-C did. A career in the Navy wasn't super great shakes seven years ago. But then, you know, Napoleon started invading things and it turned into a whole deal. And now naval captains were great national heroes and incredibly wealthy, while the landed gentry, like Baron Elliot, uh, were starting to lose prominence. Anne's father was super hung up on all of the old rules and old approaches. In his day, what Wentworth was doing wasn't seen as a path to great wealth or advancement. And then the wars came and changed everything. And I feel like the last few years have been kind of a similar experience for me, watching the entire Swift community learn, in some cases decide, how to think in Swift, what constitutes a Swifty approach. If you go back and look at some of the first Swift code you ever wrote uh, a couple years ago, it kind of looks a little bit like you ran Objective-C through a Google Translator. We didn't <laughs> define what our new idioms were going to be. We were... Uh, sort of trying to do the same thing with different words. Now we have those new idioms. We have those new ideas and new approaches. And they're not just new approaches. Sometimes they're older tools and old ideas, older ideas that are coming out in front in unexpected ways, like Wentworth finding his fortune in the Navy. And I think that's really cool. So we've got the thing that I hated, but eventually won me over, and the thing that I finally saw the value of uh, after a while. But um, if you follow me on Twitter, you might already know this. There was one thing that really made me swoon for Swift, the one flourish that absolutely won my heart. And now we're going to talk about my second favorite Austin hero, but my absolute favorite aspect of Swift. So hang on. Uh, we're going to talk about guard statements, and we're going to talk about Colonel Brandon from Sense and Sensibility. Um, here we're going to talk about the B plot of Sense and Sensibility. Uh, the A plot revolves around Regency era inheritance law, which is not fascinating, and wacky hijinks that can happen when you have four brothers that are all called Mr. Ferrers, which is a little more fun. 
Marianne Dashwood is the middle sister of the Dashwood family. She's a very romantic and sensitive soul. She reads a lot of poetry and has a lot of dreams. She's one of those. Uh, she's out walking in the moors, because of course she is, and she trips and sprains her ankle, and um, Mr. Willoughby comes riding up on his glorious steed. I think he's even wearing a cape. It might be raining. Just pick your favorite 10 romance novel cliches. He's all of them. Um, rescues her, carries her back home. It's all very romantic. Uh, this guy next door, Colonel Brandon, who has been interested in Marianne, but she thinks he's boring. Uh, Marianne uh, and Willoughby uh, spend a lot of time together. They appear to be greatly in love. But then he goes off to London and stops responding to her letters. Marianne gets invited to London and runs into him at a dance where he's incredibly rude to her and mentions, which he forgot to do before, that he's actually engaged to a wealthy heiress. Um, because Marianne Dashwood is a very sensitive soul, she falls ill, um, this is overwhelming to her. Colonel Brandon helps care for her, he sits by her side and reads her poetry while she's recovering. Um, all of those romantic things that she actually wanted. And of course, they live happily ever after. And this is, again, a story you've heard a million times. A woman falls for a confusing jerk, he breaks her heart, and then she sees the value of the good guy that was there all along. The mind turns naturally to guard statements in a moment like this. <laughs> again, from the, the official documentation, basically a guard statement is the improvement on the, you know, if X doesn't equal Y, do a thing construction. Um, so let's say we're adding a suitor to our list, and we have standards, so we want to know uh, our suitor's name, his income, whether he has a hat, and uh, what his horse's name is. All of this here, which is a way to do that, is confusing. This looks like it's your friend. It's going to cuddle up to you, and it's going to make all kinds of promises and expectations. And then when you have to debug this code in a hurry, because you need to get a bill to the client by the end of the day, this code is going to run off to London and stop taking your calls. <laughs> It's really easy to get lost in this code. You have to be careful with it because it's easy to get ahead of yourself and make assumptions about what it's doing because it's not very clear. The most important part of this code, the thing that it actually does, is buried like in the deepest part of that indentation. And the most important thing that Marianne Dashwood needed to know about Mr. Willoughby, that he was kind of a jerk and kind of already engaged, was also hidden. This one on the other hand, is really straightforward. And I feel like it's a little poetic. I'll talk about that in a second. You can immediately see where each path exits. And the actual work of the function, the part that's important, is right up front on the same level as everything else. There's no mystery here. Like Mr. Brandon, it's straightforward, and it wears its heart on its sleeve. And I think it's something kind of lovely about it. right? There's some artfulness here, but not at the expense of readability. I really like it. When I went to go see the movie version of, of Sense and Sensibility years ago, um, the person I went with hated the movie. He felt like at the end of it, uh, Marianne had settled for Colonel Brandon, and he thought Brandon and Alan Rickman deserved better than that. Um, and I was like, no, 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 you're entirely wrong. She didn't settle for him. She found exactly what she was looking for in the place she wasn't looking. Marianne wanted a man who would sweep her off her feet, who would rescue her when she was in trouble, and would sit by her side and read her poetry, which are all of the things that Brandon did when she was sick. For me, the power of a guard statement, the thing that I love, is the power of finding something that I have been looking for in an unexpected place. Guard statements, I think, are elegant both scientifically and artistically, uh, in the sense of, of what it is doing, and then also how it does that thing. I mean, I listen to it. Guard, let this thing not be nil. That's, that's a trochee. It's a cadence in poetry. Uh, Shakespeare uses it to signify that something important is about to happen. There's a gracefulness of language, what we call syntax, here at work here. And it's beautiful in a way that I don't really expect code to be. I know that code can be a creative endeavor. That is absolutely true. But I don't think people expect to see things that look like actual poetry. And for me, that's what a guard statement can be. It's kind of the difference between talking at length about the importance of meeting people where they are and accepting them for their faults and not expecting you know, them to change for you, and saying something like, 
Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It's the same idea, but one speaks truth with a small t and one speaks truth with a capital T in a universal sense. And I think a guard statement is looking for a kind of capital T truth about your code in the moment that it is invoked. And that led me to a really interesting and kind of sobering thought. That if we can find capital T truth in our code, we can put capital T truth in our code. This is a powerful realization and a really big responsibility. Code can be creative, but how often do we spend thinking of ourselves as creators in the same way that poets and playwrights do? If programming is the new literacy, which I've seen on some t-shirts, what are we writing? We have control over huge parts of our users' lives. Their financial information, their personal information, their health information. If you think about something like a dating app, that's their hopes and dreams for the future. If you think something like social networking, that's the means of their own self-expression. What greater truths are we revealing about privacy and security, and safety, and social interaction in our code? I spent a lot of my pre-Swift life using words to create meaning. And I thought when I changed careers that I would start using code to create things. And what the guard statement reminds me is that we can use code to create meaning as well. And we should always be conscious of that. In general, I feel like I spend a lot of time looking at the code, like feeling that the code I'm looking at is like a garden, and I am constantly astonished by it. There's powerful things that we can do and interesting ways that we can do them by the ways that we can use syntax to express an idea. I feel like well-written code should tell a story and that as clearly as any novel does. And hopefully I've given you another way to think about your code, whether it's in Swift or any other language, and so that you can go off and write your own code stories that are as universally truthful as Jane Austen's have been. Thank you. Woo!